Well, now on Radio 4, a lost literary reputation is at stake as Ian Peacock goes in search of the great Victorian novelist Edward Bulwer-Lytton. And just in case that name doesn't ring any bell- bells, you may be more familiar with this notorious opening line, a line which eventually subsumed his entire life and literary legacy. It was a dark and stormy night, and the captain said to one of his men, Tell us a story. And the following story I told. It was a dark and stormy night. That's where I first heard it. Not in the goons, but in the schoolyard, almost two centuries after it first appeared in a novel. But there's a lot more to Edward Bull. We'll listen, and quite a lot more to that infamous line. It's the beginning of a long, wordy, overwritten sentence. Professor Scott Rice of San Jose State University. I will inflict the entire sentence on your listeners. It was a dark and stormy night. The rain fell in torrents, except at occasional intervals when it was checked except by a violent gust of wind. When it was checked by a violent gust of wind which swept up the streets, for it is in London that our scene lies, rattling along the housetops and fiercely agitating the scanty flame of the lamps that struggled against the darkness. No one reads the novel. <laughs> everyone, everyone knows the first line, but no one reads the novel. I find that very frustrating because it's an interesting novel. Professor John Sutherland, who also finds himself fiercely agitated by the line the literati love to hate. It comes from the novel Paul Clifford, and Professor Rice has some reservations about it. Stopping with this little parenthetical remark, for it is in London that our scene lies. I mean, why not say that uh, a violent gust of wind swept up the London streets? This is no model of economy. I like writing to be a little more minimalist than this is. He tends to be bombastic. He tends to overgild the lily. That's one of the things that he was constantly satirized over. He loads heavy, what I call gratuitously polysyllabic vocabulary into sentences as if he sees a sentence as a setting and then the jewels are these words. And Like, like he uh, refers in one place to a bedroom in an inn as a somnambular accommodation or he refers to a pipe as a Promethean tube. <laughs> I mean, that, that is self-conscious, you know, that sort of saying, crying out, I have a bigger vocabulary than you do. Oh dear, not a great start to this exploration of one of the greats of Victorian literature. And that's what he was. Our greatest living novelist is how he's described in the Encyclopedia Britannica of 1859. Greater than Dickens, Thackeray, Trollope, the Brontes. He was a lordly figure, later in life an actual lord, famously dressing in black, residing in a gothic country house. And now, all that's left is the line. Even in Hartford, the town he represented as an MP. Could I ask you who Edward Bulwer Lytton was? I have no idea. I'm really sorry. Edward Bowers Lytton, did you say? Bulwer Lytton. Bulwer, yeah. I do know, but I can't remember. Well, yes, I've heard his name. I, I don't know that I've read a lot of him. 1824, <laughs> that's when he was around. How do you know that? I don't. Does he live in a big house somewhere? Who was Edward Bulwer Lytton? I don't know. Would you like to guess? No, I wouldn't. I wonder if I could ask you to um, give me your picture of, uh, of this chap. I mean, when you think of him, what do you think of? I think of Ozymandias, actually, the kind of, uh, you know, decayed and forgotten monument. Nothing besides remains, says Shelley and Ozymandias, or Ozymandias, if you like. And it's hard to argue with Professor Sutherland. If, in fact, you could get H.G. Wells' time machine and go back to the 19th century, they would have predicted that Bulwer Lytton was the novelist who would last. But, of course, he hasn't. I mean, this is a man, I mean, everyone knows that notorious opening line, which has become the great joke of literature. But people forget it was Lytton who pioneered science fiction late in life with a novel called The Coming Race, which is about a, an American who falls into a subterranean universe and meets an absolutely amazing race of women who have super feminine powers. He was very unhappily married, had a problem with women. And it was Lytton who popularised what was called the Newgate novel in Paul Clifford, which is the novel which has you know, Dark and Stormy Night, which in fact is a pioneer of what was then called Newgate fiction, but w- which we know as crime fiction. And of course it is the progenitor of Oliver Twist. Now everyone remembers Oliver Twist and Fagan. Very few people have read Paul Clifford or indeed any of his other novels. Once you get past the purple prose of the opening line of Paul Clifford, he tells a cracking story with colourful eccentric characters, acute observation and an extraordinarily prescient wit. Celebrated English banker. 
That sentence is a better illustration of verbal fallacies than all Bentham's treatises put together. The novel tells the story of a boy born into poverty. He becomes a highwayman, but he's of noble blood. The characters could come straight out of Dickens, as the foppish Lord Mauleverer, the sinister lawyer Brandon, and his daughter, the lovely Lucy. Yes, there's a soft romantic centre to this book. But its publication in 1830 was highly controversial. The hero Paul was a criminal, and sensitive souls, including Thackeray, weren't at all happy. It's a sharp critique of the British legal system and the prisons of the day. Here's Paul delivering a barbed justification of his life of crime. I acknowledge no allegiance to society. Openly I war against it, and patiently will I meet its revenge. This may be crime, but it looks light in my eyes when I gaze around and survey on all sides the masked traitors who acknowledge large debts to society, who profess to obey its laws, adore its institutions, and above all, oh, how righteously, attack all those who attack it, and who yet lie and cheat and defraud and peculate, publicly reaping all the comforts, privately filching all the profits. Plus ça change, plus say the same politicians. But Bulwer Lytton's huge appeal wasn't just as a satirist. He also had his moments of breathless romanticism. As the light breath came from her parted lips and the ivory lids closed over those eyes which only in sleep were silent and her attitude in her sleep took that ineffable grace belonging solely to childhood or the fresh youth into which childhood merges. She was just what you might imagine a sleeping Margaret. Lovely. Before that most simple and gentle of a poet's visions of womanhood. Actually, that, that, that'll do. Uh, just this last bit, please. Go on, then. Had met with Faust, or her slumbers been ruffled with a dream of love. Is that it? It is. He belonged to a tradition which was pretty well extinguished by the Victorians, that to say high Gothic. In fact, one of his Gothic relics is still very well known, though people don't associate it with Lytton, that to say Nebworth. Everyone knows Nebworth because they have pop concerts there. But it's worth going there. If you, ha if you don't go there, you probably know it from films like The Omen, which were set there. And it, it, it is pretty spine-chilling. In fact, it's rumoured that Lytton's ghost walks in Nebworth and luckless women. He was a terrible... Womanizer, luckless women lying in their bed feel a cold, clammy hand on them. People often ask me, you know, are there ghosts? There are definitely ghosts, but I don't go out of my way to come across them. I have to sleep here at night. And so, wrapped in a long cape, I made my way, in bright daylight, for health and safety reasons, to Nebworth House in deepest home county's Hertfordshire. It's the most gothic pile I've ever set foot in. Its gargoyle-clad exterior and heavy wooden innards have made it an ideal home for Batman and all manner of hammer horror heroes, not to mention the odd satanic-looking rock band. I was frankly disappointed its current inhabitant, Henry Lytton Cobbold, was a pretty down-to-earth chap in sensible shoes. He's very fond of his ancestral home, of its most famous inhabitant, his great-great-great-grandfather, and of all the spooky stories and paraphernalia. We created a bicentenary exhibition of his birth, and uh, the alarm kept going off every night. So one night we had a night watchman come and sit down in the exhibition with his dog, and the way the night watchman tells it is that suddenly, during the night, the room did start to move and the ropes around the exhibit started to, to sway and he very much got the impression that indeed this was Bull Lytton visiting his exhibit. That burning glare, so intense, so livid, yet so living, had in it something that was almost human in its passion of hate and mockery. An uninvited evil presence summed up in one of Lytton's later novels, Zanoni, a story of the occult, sorcery, and opera. He was born in 1803, the third son of a Norfolk squire and his Lytton descendant wife. Edward was sort of supposedly his mother's favourite and when she inherited Nebworth off her father she passed it on to him. He went to Cambridge and had an affair with Lady Caroline Lamb at the neighbouring estate Brocket. Caroline Lamb being Byron's former lover. Edward Bulwer-Lytton went on to marry a fiery Irish it girl. 
His mother didn't approve of the marriage, so she cut him off at that point, which meant that he absolutely had to write for his pennies. And the early novels became successes, particularly Pelham, which was a huge hit in the 1820s. When George Routledge began his railway library in 1851, he bought all of Bulwer Lytton's copyrights for £21,000, which at that time was a huge amount of money. And it was reported that the most popular novel uh, for the railway reading public in the 1850s was Bulwer Lytton's novel Pelham. It was a, an anatomy of what gentlemanliness was. I did not like that green coat you wore when I last saw you. You look best in black, which is a great compliment, for people must be very uh, distingué in appearance in order to do so. Pelham's opinionated mother offering fashion advice. According to quite a few encyclopedias, Pelham was single-handedly responsible for the rise of the black tie look, the dinner jacket and the sober office suit. But cultural historian Pamela Church Gibson of the London College of Fashion says this is a slightly inflated version of the truth, although Pelham did have an impact. He was satirising the dandies of earlier in the century, including Beau Brummel. But ironically, he himself became the subject of Carlyle's satire and Sartre as artist much later on. Carlyle was much more seriously horrified by dandies than Bulwer Lytton. Bulwer Lytton is loving the thing he hates, hating the thing he loves, pretending to mock the person who's always in front of the glass, but of course that's him. Now, thought I, as I place myself before my glass, shall I gently please or sublimely astonish the fashionables of Cheltenham? Ah, oh, bah, the latter school is vulgar. Byron spoilt it. I wear the black coat, waistcoat and trousers. Brush my hair as much out of curl as you can and give an air of graceful negligence to my tout ensemble. He didn't invent anything, but then nobody ever does. People simply tap into something that's going on and are often seen as having created a trend when in fact they've played a decisive part in something that was already moving along. But what he did do, I think, was keep somehow a thread of interest going through this rather stodgy period. From this kind of flurry around Byron, you get a long period of, you know, people writing their novels like Trollope and then going off to the post office. And then you get this flurry of, art, of the artist as special person at the end. Presenting yourself as a work of art, which he did, is something that, you know, he took from Byron and kept going. Check this out. An authentic Nebworth creaky door, leading me to more discoveries about this proto-Oscar Wilde of rural Hertfordshire. This is very much Edward Ball Lytton's library. That corner over there is pretty well uh, exclusively his work. I mean, he was... It's like a, a, virtually like a wall of a bookshop. I mean, uh, there must be about several hundred. Uh, there are. He was there. extremely prolific and he would write all night and his valet um, would know whether to wake him up in the morning, dependent on uh, how many of the seven cigars left by his bed uh, the night before were still left in the morning. <laughs> he was a great believer mm. in smoke and atmosphere, and certainly he created, I think, for himself on those evening writing sessions quite a heady mix of tobacco and, uh, and Victorian paraphernalia and, and history and, uh, and romance. It was not sleep. It was not delirium. It was the dream wakefulness which opium sometimes induces when every nerve grows tremulously alive and creates a corresponding activity in the frame to which it gives a false and hectic vigour. Uh, what have we got here? We've got... Um, so you've got the Parisians, you've got the disowned Lucretia, all Devereux, by him, all, all by, by him. him. The Last of the Barons, a great historical oh, novel. Oh, Zanoni. That, that's the uh, very spooky occult one, isn't Zanoni it? Zanoni is the occult yeah. one, as indeed The Strange Story is, to Next Door, both, both mystical occult books. My novel, Falkland, Harold, great uh, historical novel, and of course The Last Days of Pompeii, which is perhaps his most famous. What's and, this one here? Uh, Rienzi. That's, uh, that's an interesting book because that was the one that inspired Wagner's breakthrough opera. In German translation, many of these novels have never gone out of print. And Wagner's Rienzi wasn't just inspired by, it was pretty much a setting of Bulwer Lytton's novel. He was restive, indefatigable, always trying new styles, new subjects. Professor Sutherland. One of the many things which Lytton did, one of his many achievements as a, as a writer, was to innovate in the field of serialization. 
And the whole point about serialization is you have, to some extent, to hook the reader from the start. Which is exactly what the line, it was a dark and stormy night, set out to do. You also had to leave them wanting more, writing to the doof-doofs, as they say in the EastEnders office. He dropped on his knee, left his kiss and his tears upon Lucy's cold hand. The next moment, she heard his step on the stairs. The door closed heavily and jarringly upon him. And Lucy felt one bitter pang, and for some time at least, she felt no more. Prolific, popular, versatile, and though it sounds a modern concept, an A-list celebrity. Think Dan Brown or J.K. Rowling, or even better, both in a stormy relationship played out in the popular press. At the top of the stairs at Nebworth House, there's evidence of Bulwer Lytton's high-profile marital meltdown in the form of a stunning portrait of his wife, Rosina. Their divorce became a huge... Well, it wasn't a divorce, it was a separation. She refused to divorce him. Became a huge core celeb of, of the day. You know, she'd turn up at his political meetings and throw things at him. There was a very famous instance where in, in Hartford where he'd just been elected into Lord Derby's government and she turned up at the back and at the top of her voice shouted, you know, men of hearts, uh, if you have the hearts of men, you know, this man you've just elected to be secretary for the colonies should have been sent to the colonies in a transport. You know, Very good she, use of rhetoric. <laughs> every time he wrote a novel, she would write one parodying his novel. I mean, so, for instance, when Bulwer wrote a play for Charles Dickens called Not So Bad As We Seem, she wrote one called Much Worse Than They Seem. Surrounded by portraits here. Uh, so endless stories within stories within stories. Oh my God! There's a skull. <laughs> what? 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 Those are actual skulls from Pompeii, dug up in Pompeii and presented to Paul Lytton in respect of the success of his novel, The Last Days of Pompeii. And in fact, it was the novel that inspired so much travel and tourism to Pompeii in the, in the 1800s. I know in his living room he used to have a crystal ball on the equivalent of his coffee table. This is here. Or? And that is it up there, the, the, yes indeed. So it's a crystal ball on a wooden stand. It is specifically designed to stare into and picture the future. I wonder... Did he ever imagine gazing into that cloudy crystal ball that his Nebworth home would be forever linked, not with him, but with Led Zeppelin? Or that his literary reputation would hang on a mere seven words? Could he see a small cartoon dog sitting on top of his kennel in 20th century America, tapping out into his little typewriter? It was a dark and stormy night. Because that's the other place I remember seeing the line as a child. Yes, in a Snoopy book. And in a little shrine in the great man's study, there's a copy of that very book. Snoopy and it was a dark and stormy night by, um, by Charles Schultz. Down here we've got a jar of Bovril, which um, when Bovril was being named, they took the word Vril from his novel The Coming Race. Das kommende Geschlecht, it says in German there. That's obviously a German version. This is a German version of The Coming Race and indeed yeah. other foreign uh, editions of... Uh, of his work. Die uh, letzten Tage von Pompeii. John Philip Sousa, who of course wrote the Monty Python theme. Oh, Sousa phones, yes. yes. Wrote a suite based on the last days of Pompeii, which the composer himself always cited as being his very favourite piece of his own work. Sousa with a Lytton twist. And of course, there's this uh, scurrilous professor in California who started up this annual competition, Professor Scott Rice, who every year holds the Bulwer Lytton contest, which is a contest to come up with what he considers to be the worst opening line to a novel. It started back in graduate school, being an inveterate browser of used bookstores, you frequently ran across Bulwer Lytton's novels because he was very popular with our great grandparents, you know, that he was, in fact, up until the First World War, he was as popular as Dickens. I read seven or eight of his novels and then read and wrote a paper on him. Later on, when I was teaching at San Jose State and we had to put up with this literary contest that attracted all kinds of unintentionally bad writing, uh, it occurred to me, why not be honest and just come right out and say you want bad writing to start with? We named it after Bulwer Lytton, and it took off. We challenge entrants to submit bad opening sentences to imaginary novels, and so they send it to us, and then we show it to our panel of undistinguished judges and then pick the winners. Professor Scott Rice has immortalized those winners in print. Edmund waited, then immediately waited again. <laughs> or, or just beyond the narrows, the river widens. <laughs> 
You want to hear another good one? This is Let's one of my all-time favorites. With a curvaceous figure that Venus would have envied, a tanned, unblemished oval face framed with lustrous, thick brown hair, deep azure blue eyes fringed with long black lashes, perfect teeth that vied for competition, and a small straight nose, merrily had a beauty that defied description. <laughs> 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 This is almost worth the high blood pressure, he thought, as yet another mosquito exploded. <laughs> I mean, these are the, more the comic variety. Brutal, <laughs> isn't it? Oh, yes. Well, I, I don't mean to be that severe with Borlet, and I'm also kind of grateful to him. And I, he was thoughtful, and he did his homework. He may have been the person who really invented the historical novel, as we think of it. The novel that tries to give an accurate representation with lots of good circumstantial detail, you know, of life in another era. Gosh, so he virtually invented historical fiction as well. So how and why did the reputation of this seminal figure collapse? Professor John Sutherland. The whole of English literature, indeed the whole of English society, was moving towards the middle class. Nobility was not something you were born with. It wasn't a handle to your name. It was the way you behaved. Thackeray redefined what it was to be a gentleman. And it wasn't that you had blue blood. It was because you behaved in a certain way, like Dobbin and Vanity Fair. So there was, in fact, an ideological problem with Bulwer. He represents, you know, the end of a number of traditions, a Gothic tradition, obviously, but also a sense that literature was an aristocratic preserve. And that was very much against the temper of high and late Victorian England. OK, understood, we don't like pompous toffs. But, like me, Professor Sutherland isn't prepared to join the Bulwer bashers and the assault on his most famous relic. It was a dark and stormy night. That kind of jump into the mise-en-scene is not that unusual. It's not, it's not that ridiculous a line, to be honest. See, I think it's pretty good. I have yeah. to say that, I mean, I teach writing a bit, and, and I have to say, starting with the crisis, that's a, that's Indeed, a big, yeah. big rule, isn't it? And then, then starting with the sense of place, uh, yeah. appealing to the five Rapping senses. The Certainly not ludicrous. The agitating the scanty flame of the lamps that struggled against the darkness. Great line. Fantastic. It takes something uh, special to come up with a line which, uh, you know, resonates so much uh, through the centuries. And I really think it does. I mean, it wouldn't surprise me in the least if I were to wake up tomorrow morning to the radio alarm and hear a weather forecaster on the Today programme pointing out that... If you happen to be in London, it was a dark and stormy night. The rain fell in torrents, except at occasional intervals, when it was checked by a violent gust of wind which swept up the streets. But beginning our Nor would I be surprised if I heard Nick Robinson reporting on yesterday's parliamentary kerfuffles, saying to John Humphreys... Well, John, it was a dark and stormy night. The rain fell in torrents, except at occasional intervals, when it was checked by a violent gust of wind which swept up the streets. For it is in Westminster that our scene lies. Inside the commons, the back benches... Hmm, perhaps it's a shade overwritten for Nick, but it would be perfect for Stuart Hall over on Five Live. It was a dark and stormy night. The black rain fell in torrents, except occasionally, when it was abated by a violent gust of wind which swept up the streets. For it was in London that our scene lies, rattling the rooftops and fiercely agitating the banners of the Arsenal faithful. Thank you, Steve. Newcastle were no, 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 thank, thank resourceful, thank, redoubtable. Thank you. In the second oh, half, scoring queen. three goals in five minutes, Arsenal simply gazed on the devastation with macabre gothic horror. <laughs> Stuart, you obviously enjoyed that. It was good. I, I love over-the-top stuff. Do you think that uh, Edward Bulwer listen would make a good football commentator? Absolutely. In this day and age, when everybody worships the plain and the banal, I think he would be top of the pops. Edward Bulwer Lytton didn't try his hand as a football commentator or as a weatherman, as far as I'm aware. But the Nick Robinsons of 19th century England would certainly have reported on his career in politics, particularly his brief appearance in the Cabinet. For six months he was Secretary of the Colonies, and in that six months it happened to be the time when British Columbia in Canada and Queensland in Australia were both created if it hadn't have been him sitting in that seat uh, at that time, it's almost certain that British Columbia would now be part of America. They had a gold rush up there, and thousands and thousands of American miners went pouring up there, and then they started agitating to turn British Columbia into a state. And he nipped that in the bud. 
I mean, an extraordinary thing if you think nowadays, you know, how different the political landscape would be. If he were alive today, he would be a perennial guest on talk shows. Oh, he'd be on midweek, I'm sure, yes. Um, I have to say that Henry Lytton Cobbold, perhaps jokingly, accused you of a scurrilous attack. I think he's speaking in the spirit of his illustrious ancestor. <laughs> scurrilous is the sort of word he'd have used, I think. I am flattered to be described as scurrilous. <laughs> Professor Scott Rice. He is your great, He's great, my great, great, great grandfather, and I think he was a great, great, great man. And I feel very privileged to come from those roots. A proud descendant. But how might he be footnoted by more objective cultural commentators? Pamela Church Gibson. I'd say Bulwer Lytton, the man who wrote a novel satirizing dandies and was himself satirized as a dandy. The man who had a lot to do with the artist as celebrity the celebrity as artist. And Professor John Sutherland, one of the few to have read more than 10 of Lytton's 27 novels. He never got into a rut. And I think, you know, he's blazed a lot of trails for other writers. But whatever I say, no one is going to read the man, unfortunately, except for that wretched first line of Paul Glyver. How do you feel about the fact that this line, A Dark and Stormy Night, has totally eclipsed him for most people? It's a fact, isn't it? Whether we like it or not, it has. It's not the only one of his. I mean, the pen is mightier than the sword, is used in journalism. Every week you see that in a newspaper headline, and that's, of course, one of his lines. Did uh, you your not lines wish that still... he was there as well, though? That he, that he was there as well as the tip of the iceberg? Well, I do, and I'd like to see him back on the syllabus in this country. The ones I've read would definitely lend themselves to films. I mean, you've worked in film. I've done a modern screenplay version of, of The Last Days of Pompeii, and I would love to do other ones. I think Rienzi's crying out to be done. I think Harold is crying out to be done. I think they would make terrific movies. I um, mean, you know, because they... Paul Clifford would be an excellent one to do as well. I mean, you know, they do all have these wonderful central romances, which to me is crucial for big movies today. I really think the BBC should do it, if they're listening. How could we start? Um, well, I think we start with Fade In, and then yeah. it was a dark and stormy night. Nice dot, one. Dot. I love it. I love it. Okay. Now, who are we going to call? Uh, yeah, we can have... Uh, who, who, who would be the star? I think we need to call Kira, Kira, don't we? And Dovey Johnny. And... Yes, that really is me. Considering a film or TV adaptation of a novelist, I expected to be a sort of gothic McGonagall. But I'm a convert. There's so much more to his legacy than a line from Snoopy. And he was even the man who persuaded Dickens to give Great Expectations a happy ending. Maybe Lytton himself anticipated his own obscurity. In his introduction to Paul Clifford, a few short paragraphs before the dark and stormy line that eclipsed his entire career and his extraordinary life, he wrote this. We authors, like the children in the fable, track our journey through the maze by the pebbles which we strew along the path. For others who wander after us, they may attract no notice, or, if noticed, seem to them but scattered by the caprice of chance. But we, when our memory would retrace our steps, review in the humble stones the witnesses of our progress, the landmarks of our way. <laughs>